Sure. Good morning. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see so many people here. Um, my name is Adapia DeRico. And um, professionally, I am a real estate investor, primarily real estate. Um, I work in a private equity firm. I'm also a partner in a Bitcoin hedge fund. I have been in the financial services industry largely since I was 18 and um, have also started companies and been an entrepreneur and a founder and a small business owner. And um, my journeys basically have brought me back around to this place of of um, truly empowering myself by building and owning uh, and properly managing my wealth because I did not always do that despite um, my background. So it's been a wonderful journey for me to feel this way. And I, at some point this year, I kind of woke up and said, if I feel this way, and this is so good for me, and I'm so well versed in it, then this is something that I have to share with others. And um, Jennifer and I have known each other for a few years, we've talked about this amongst ourselves. And, um, and so we're just thrilled to bring it to you and Leadership Global. Absolutely. And hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Burnham Grubbs. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of Leadership Global and Adapia and I have had a vision for bringing this Women of Wealth presentation to women all over the world for, like she said, several years now. Um, I guess my background is I come from humble beginnings. I worked since I was 11 years old. I got myself into Princeton University um, on a full scholarship and then basically went into the real world and had to hustle. And eventually over time, um, took a job as an insurance advisor, uh, thinking it would just be sort of an entree into the financial world. Started getting my eyes open really fast about what was happening with a lot of the actors in the financial advisory space. I was always great at math and I always loved people. And so I started to really dig in and became an expert in insurance matters. And along the way, I've become an advisor for top tier celebrities and athletes all over the world and business managers and high net worth folks, as well as friends and neighbors. Um, I kind of focus a lot from the risk management side of things because I've always had to sort of plan for the worst, hope for the best and capitalize on what comes. And that's kind of a fundament of, I guess, what we're looking to bring into education and awareness for all of us is how do we continue to leverage ourselves into positions where we can have a little bit more pleasure, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more time. Um, and the truth of it is, as women, we work so much in service. And we're just bred to be so sort of thoughtlessly giving to other people that there's time for a real sea change and how we can also bring assets to ourselves in abundance. And so uh, hopefully between Adapia's vast areas of expertise and then my background, we have a cross section. And our goal is to create a dialogue here also with everybody who's attending. And so let's dive in because there's a lot to cover today. Uh, the topic is really, uh, let me share my screen more effectively there. How to define your true net worth in order to leverage and protect it. So the reason this is so important, if you think about this, and I, I encourage you, if you want to check out this Brookings report, it's the history of women's work and wages and how it has created success for us all. The truth is that the average middle class income in America grew from 57,000 to 69,000 in 2018. So over the course of arguably, let's see, 20, 40 years, it only grew by what, 11, $12,000. There's an illusion that the economy keeps, you know, getting better and better. But the truth of it is, it's grown only marginally so far in terms of average middle class comfort and, and wealth. And the truth of it also is, that if women had not entered the workforce, which they did essentially in 1979 is when we entered the workforce, the, the growth would have been only 58,000, it would have been less than $1,000 worth of growth in the economy. In other words, women have accounted for 91% of total income gain for families in the last 40 years in the United States. Hopefully that helps everybody here realize just how valuable women and our contributions have been to the world economy, to the United States economy, and the fact that we've entered the workforce, even though that's taken really for granted and discounted so much, okay, we're basically carrying the global and American economy on our backs. <laughs> and yet we're underpaid and we get only 83 cents per every dollar. Still, today, even with all of the changes that are going on. So we're super valuable, more than ever before, not just in the workplace, but as we all know, also in the home, you know, but I, I'm 
very cognizant of this. I have two children and I work. You know, there's a time poverty that makes a lot of women feel that they're still never enough, never good enough at either being a parent or a homemaker or a pet owner or a, an employee. There's just a time poverty. And that was also, by the way, part of this Brookings report. I really encourage you to check it out. It specifically addresses time poverty in the United States as a, work, as a result of two-person working households. Our wages continue to be lower, which makes us think maybe our contributions aren't as worthy. And then there's also the fact that men have, to their credit, really stepped up. So now that more women are working and there are families where both people are equal, in fact, 40% uh, of households now, the woman is the main breadwinner. That's another stat we didn't include here. Men have doubled their contributions at home to nine hours a week on average. And women have cut theirs in half, so we're down to 15 hours a week on average. But even so, in families, even where the woman's working at least 35 hours a week and the husband's working just as much, women are still working 22% more on household work than men. So all of those can result in a feeling of not being understood, not being seen, not being um, valued or appreciated despite contributing arguably the most. And that's something to, to, to know that if we start to internalize that, we'll then start to think our, our worth is zero, even though it's actually not even true. So part of this piece is just raising some awareness through these stats. Another stat is there was a study from the World Economic Forum that literally proved women are 10% more productive on the job than men. So our output per hour worked is also greater. Women are incredibly valuable employees. I could go on and on, but we're just doing an overview here and trying to get to some of the other statistics and other um, actionable pieces. So this is more like a rah, rah, rah for everybody here to understand that it may not look like it on paper. You might be getting paid 83 cents for every dollar. You might be doing work at home that nobody seems to even care about, but it's quantifiably valuable and it's quantifiably more than most people around you are doing. Uh, Adipia, do you want me to kind of keep going or do you want to take turns? Yeah, I, I would love for you to take risk management because that's really your area of focus. And then when we get to the assets and investing part, I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So here's the thing. When you're doing things that are invisible to others or are not being validated by others, here's a great way to flip the switch and start realizing just how valuable you are. Uh, coming from the risk management perspective, which is, of course, what I do all day long, Okay, you can ask this question, what would happen if I weren't here contributing? So yes, my boss is telling me that my you know, work I'm doing hasn't created the results that they wanted or whatever, but let's just take a moment and think, what if I weren't here doing all of the things I have done? Where would he be without me? Or where would the family be if I weren't here? And then you would start to very quickly know your value and so would they, right? Because if you're a household income contributor, for example, and you know exactly what your salary is, that's part of your worth. You're bringing that every day, every year to the table and that's quantifiable. So if you're making $100,000 a year and you're gonna be working for the next 20 years providing for this family, right there, that's $2 million. You're worth $2 million minimum, just you yourself. Um, as a caretaker, okay? so. If, it's a well-known fact in risk management that even if someone is a homemaker and not working, if God forbid, okay, they were to pass and the spouse was now suddenly trying to juggle taking care of a family and working, that spouse would lose time and productivity at work and their income would go down. And or they would have to pay somebody to do childcare, which full time around the clock, at least in LA, is minimum $50,000 a year. So multiply that by 10 or 15 until the kids can you know, somewhat be latchkey and take care of themselves. Then again, you're worth 500,000 minimum or 750,000 minimum, just as the quote, homemaker that's invisible, okay? Um, and then if you're doing chair, child care, caretaking and working, then you can start to do the math and see you're worth already two, three million dollars minimum, just as you walk and breathe. Then at a company, if you have an employee um, situation and you're a valuable rainmaker or you're bringing in some sort of you know um, product or service for your team you know the value of what you're doing you know the value that that they would have to hire somebody else to do the same job okay you know what that costs and then if you're an owner of a company and this company is kind of riding on your back 
then you know how valuable you are to the living and breathing of that company itself. And most companies, if you were to try to go into an M&A and sell them, we're going to probably, as a rule of thumb, we say you can get somewhere between 2x and 10x value, which is um, considered to be like your annual gross. So if you're carrying a company on your back or a rainmaker for it or a key employee, you know the value of that company is 2x or 10x gross revenue. Start doing the math. That's part of your value. Okay, and then of course, a lot of women are disproportionately in charge of helping elder relatives or they're donating on like time with, you know, boards or charities or whatever. If they were going to pay somebody to do that job, it's expensive. Do the math. What would it cost to pay somebody else to do that job? That all comes into your value. And by the way, risk management is usually about protecting against that value, against the God forbid, what if scenario if you suddenly weren't there and they were going to be up a creek. And it's possible to protect that. And that is something you should be doing. So you know, we can have a whole conversation about that. Um, but again, as a reminder, when you're feeling like the contribution's invisible, just flip that switch. Start quantifying exactly what you're bringing to the table. And that will help you validate yourself. Um, and then you'll someone, you know, if you're like me, you'll be really surprised at the number. If I see myself as worth five bucks, and then I'm like, wait, I'm worth millions of dollars just on, in terms of what I bring to the table. It's kind of nice for your um, self-esteem. Jennifer, we have a question. Um, do you include benefits in that math? Oh, that's a great, if you're the one who has the good benefits at work and most benefits today, the average American family pays um, $2,000 a month for insurance. So that's another $24,000 a year that you're bringing to the table. Is that what you meant in the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Benefits are really, really important in America. And a lot of people work at jobs just for the benefits these days. So yes, that absolutely, absolutely is part of the math. Thanks, good question. So, um, so there's you know the risk management, which is the flipping of the switch. Maybe they're taking you for granted at home or at work for whatever reason. Just flip the switch and think about that and assert for your own self first the actual quantifiable value of what you're bringing to the table and then know that number and bring that into your mindset. And that's part of it. And then here's another part of it, Adapia, you can take this slide. Yeah, so in the traditional sense of net worth, um, you know, traditionally we're talking about assets um, minus liabilities. So um, in general, from a financial perspective, um, we want to see your net worth is going to fluctuate over time. And net worth is really meant to give you a snapshot of your financial situation at any given point in time. It is fluid. When you come out of college, you are probably having negative net worth because your liabilities, your student loans, et cetera, are much higher than anything you own. Um, and so when we think about net worth value of assets, that is the more traditional sense of net worth. So the thing for me, the way I think about assets is really um, important because there's a lot of definitions and in a net worth calculation, some some sites or people will say like you can include things like cars and jewelry, like anything you can sell for cash. I like to be a lot more specific with the way I think about my assets is that what has inherent value that's not something I can sell for cash, but is something that is going to grow in value and throw off cash. So make money for me. Um, and we've had this narrative over time since the 50s that owning your home, that is a way to build equity and value. This is true. Um, what is no longer true is that your home is going to be the thing you retire on. Um, really important. And so my perspective comes from building more assets and strategically using debt so that as your assets grow, they become income earning because currently I'm the asset, you're the asset, right? You're the one working to make money. And what we want to do is get your money to make money for you. Um, there's this, I've been re-watching um, 30 Rock and there's this episode where Lemon says to Jack, hey, can you do that thing for me that rich people do and make your money make more money, <laughs> right? Um, it's such a great little, it's like, a, it's like a great little skit. And it's like, that's exactly right. And it's not just rich people, right? Um, it's totally doable. But some things to keep in mind with like assets. So assets are generally going to be your home, any kind of rental properties, any kind of investments, brokerage accounts, IRAs, et cetera. Um, 
And it's an asset, even though you could sell your, you know, Gucci purse for cash, that is not an asset. So when you're making purchases and a car is not an asset, it's a depreciable asset. If you have a business and you can write your car off, that is fantastic, but you don't buy cars, boats, planes, like those are depreciable assets. Those don't actually add to true value on your net worth scale where you can build money that makes money for you. Um, A really great statement here, just the way I said that your home is like, I wouldn't bank on my home being the thing I retire on. In fact, I I do not. Um, Same with inheritance. Um, That's a bonus. If that ever happens, bonus, that's great, but not something that we can rely on to take care of us later. Um, so another thing, cause many of us are small business owners is that your business is valuable, especially if it can be sold. Um, and so that is definitely something to keep in mind. And most, uh, most of us will have 401ks, IRAs are going to be in the stock market. So that also fluctuates up and down. Um, on the liability side, we talked about the risk management work that, um, that Jennifer uh, elucidated on so well. And another thing to keep in mind with liabilities are debts. So it's going to be your mortgages, student loans, credit cards, et cetera. Um, and not all debt is created equal. There's ways to strategically use debt to actually boost your assets. Um, and also something really important is how you arbitrage interest rates. So you actually always want to try to be refinancing all things being equal, like depending on fees, but the lower you can get your, your interest rate, the less money of what you're earning goes to pay that off. Because as we're earning money, if we have to throw our money into debt for things that maybe weren't really enhancing um, our quality of life or our goals, that becomes a really important number. It's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of decades. Um, and so also, if you've ever needed to get a mortgage recently or a car or anything, your, you know, your, um, your credit score also depends on how, how much debt you have. That's an important factor. And If your credit score is lower, you're going to get higher interest rates. So this is really important to understand our liabilities um, because they do have a massive impact on our monthly or annual or just like the way that we live and where our money goes in essence. Um, So that's just a a bit of a discussion there around assets and liabilities. But in in the most basic form, your net worth, which is a snapshot of your financial picture in in this moment in time or any moment in time, is your assets minus your your liabilities. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, We put together this um, just just like a pie chart. So for example, um, a way to look at and track. So I track my net worth. And you might want to do it quarterly. I do it a little more often. I'm a little more active. Um, I could, I could certainly track it hourly with some of the crypto stuff these days, but you know, that's just like crazy making. You don't want to be in it that much. It's really enough to do it on a quarterly basis, helps you understand what's going on, but to understand your financial assets fully, just even just start to make a list of everything you own that's valuable. Um, and so this is uh, this is a sample of um, of one way that you could look at it. Yeah, and I'll add one thing. So what what Adapia is saying is be choosy about what gets to be included in this list, right? So yes, your business is valuable, your home is valuable, your Prada purse, your jewelry. You would only have to sell that in a fire sale. You would lose money on it. It's not that doesn't count. You're looking to basically only include things that have growth in their value there. Now we know the stock market's gonna fluctuate and all that stuff, but there is long-term growth, you know, theoretically. So only including the things that are poised for growth, not depreciation, when you're looking at your your assets. Uh, okay, so this is just a sample, right? Some of you might have other, you know, things in there, but this is pretty typical maybe for people. And the idea is how do you add slices into this pie chart? where you have more and more things that are growing for you? Um, And how do you seek to leverage that based on um, opportunities you're sitting on? So you can change your net worth by knowing where you're starting from. 
And that's why that pie chart's important. Be honest with yourself, right? Even if you look at that pie chart and you're like, oh my God, I have nothing. That's okay. It's really okay to understand that. That's actually where we all begin is, oh my gosh, I don't have anything. And that's where you might say, you know, I really better start to find a way to own the place I'm living in as opposed to renting or whatever your first step is. It's really important that inventory is honest. And then once you have a little bit more, it's important to be evaluating it constantly to look for opportunities. So for example, a lot of people are in a home maybe today and they may not be thinking about the fact that you're sitting on an opportunity because you could probably with the real estate market having appreciated the way it has, you can get a HELOC, a home equity line of credit because there's probably double the value in your home um, over what the mortgage that you have is. And if you access that cash at an interest rate that's as low as most interest rates are right now, you may be able to put some of that money to work for you on opportunities where your upside potential is far greater than the interest rate on that loan. So if the interest rate on the loan is 2% or 5%, and there are opportunities to invest and gain 15%, 20%, 25%, that arbitrage is really something to be thinking about because especially you have to remember the time value of money and the time value of investment. So if you're in your 30s or your 40s and you manage to get into some investment structures that are gonna carry over time, it creates a compound interest. The gain over time is key. And the sooner you start it, the better. If you start when you're in your 50s or your 60s, you have very little time for it to iterate for you. The sooner you do it, the better. So you get that kind of accretive compound effect of these little tiny moves that you're making now to leverage yourself. Another one, you know how to free up cash. So we thoughtlessly sometimes participate in our 401ks in the market. We're very much bred to believe that the market is like, you know, it as far as how we gain or grow wealth. Well, I always like to say it's like hitching yourself to somebody who's bipolar. You know, there are highs and lows, it might be exhilarating, it's unpredictable, but at the end of the day, you don't know for sure it'll be there when you need it to be there. It's not solid, it fluctuates. So really you don't wanna necessarily just automatically and mindlessly only invest in the stock market. That's honestly really like a little crazy because your needs are gonna continue to be your needs at different points in your life and you need something you can really count on that's a little bit more structured. So if you kind of find out how to participate in other assets that aren't all in one basket, you're gonna be in a better position. And so to that point, if you're at a company and there's a 401k and you're putting in, you know, whatever, 12%, but they're not matching your contributions, think twice about that. Because really, if you're matching it, okay, that's free money for your from your employer. That totally makes sense because every dollar you put in automatically gets you another dollar for free and then also growth. But if they're not matching, okay, then maybe you want to reserve and put just a little part of what you have into your 401k and then look at where you can keep some of that cash flow available for other opportunities that you can start to play with and invest in. Um, another thing, uh, I see this all the time. If you have insurance policies, they might have been way overpriced when you bought them. A lot of people in my industry, and this is part of why I started doing what I do, they really oversell or they don't use the best, the best um, cost-effective designs um, because unfortunately most people are driven by trying to upsell and, and make the premiums as high, high as they can make them or whatever. So if you have insurance policies, do an insurance review, get a second opinion from a good broker who's not tied to one carrier. and, and and you might be able to free up a lot of money you didn't even realize or get some of the money you have and those working for you to enhance your wealth. Um, this is just like an encouraging thing. Your, your net worth is probably more than you think, right? So back to that exercise we did at the very beginning, take stock, realize, you know, even though sometimes people think there's just never enough or they're always running behind the eight ball or whatever, like take stock sometimes and realize, wait, I am sitting on a home. I could access a HELOC if I really wanted to. Maybe just that moment of taking stock can help position you to start thinking more clearly and less automatically. Oh, another big one of mine, like a huge pet peeve. If you have good credit and you're in any loan, find out if you could get a better loan rate because you probably can. And if you get a really good um, loan broker, you'll probably beat what your bank is offering you. Um, I know a great one, I know many, but I know a really great one that a, a good friend gave me and they're, they're so much better than the bank um, and they're, they're everywhere. So it's just really important to get access to that, especially right now in this period of extremely low interest rate opportunities. It's, it's one of the most important things you can do. 
Um, and also, if you do own a company and you haven't put in a 401k, maybe you ought to, right? Because you get to control whether there's matching, whether there isn't. There are a lot of advantages potentially for business owners, especially if you have a really good fantastic, good accountant. I said, make sure your account is fantastic, current, and creative. Yeah, you need them to be up to date on the new laws. You need them to understand how to leverage things. If you're just dialing it in and using like, I don't know, like doing your own taxes or, you know, using somebody from uh, like down the block that's like one of those cookie cutter places, um, think twice, especially if you own a business um, or have investments because you could be leveraging much more strategically and again, freeing up money that you're wasting on taxes. Um, okay, Adipia, do you want to take this slide? Yeah. So in, you know, in general, um, we're talking about knowing your true worth and your value. So net worth financially, and then like worth and value from the risk management perspective and what our time and our efforts are worth. Um, and the key really is understanding and being constantly aware of this because we're leveraging and redefining and also constantly refining. Um, like I said in the beginning, like actual net worth will fluctuate over time and that's okay. Um, and so having an overall picture, so having a financial picture of where you stand, this to me is baseline. It's baseline step to then take further steps. You have to know where you're starting from to know where you want to go. And so all of it comes together. And I know in my own experience, when I really started to really decide to, to dial it in after a few years of, um, I'll call it just like wayward uh, kind of activities that took me away from a, like a really strong financial foundation is that in order for me to understand what was going on is I had to take a snapshot of what was going on, right? It's like, it's like, if you don't see it, you don't know. Um, and so it all really starts here. And, you know, when it comes to the negotiations, um, as, as Jennifer talked about, it's like knowing your full worth and value helps you be a better negotiator. So, you know, we get better results in everything when we clearly know how to communicate and what we're communicating. So all of this is about what in order that we can communicate in order that we can get access and grow and grow and grow in so many ways. And this is so much about from the inner to the outer, like this is an inner work that then gets expressed on the outer. Um, and from that empowerment perspective, uh, it really, I mean, I can't even, I can't even begin to tell you, and maybe some of you will share in a little bit, like your, like your stories, if you have them about, like, I decided to really take the bull by the horns and get my financial situation in order. And it's been so empowering. And as then my confidence has grown and my access has grown and my network has grown and my net worth has grown, et cetera, et cetera. And it all started with a decision. Um, and it's like really important it's totally possible. It's, it's not that challenging. Like the, it, it's actually not that hard. It just takes the willingness to go in and to look at it, especially look at the things that we might not want to look at, like our debt, um, or things that we, that might make us feel ashamed. Like, oh, I should be better off at this point in my life. No, no, I disagree entirely. Wherever you are is where you are, where you want to go is the thing to focus on. So, um, I know that that's very much um, been part of my story and my journey too, is overcoming a lot of internalized guilt and shame and judgment. Um, and overcoming that was, was the first step to then look at the finances, to then make decisions based on where I'm at and where I want to go. Totally. I was going to add that when we start to think with our head up for water, about exactly what we can do, we start to find out, and we have ways now even in this dialogue we're creating here, how to get tools that are easily available to us. So for example, if you have to buy a car, there's a thing called a car broker, a car broker who works for free, who will help you find a car and get a better deal and negotiate it for you. So you don't have to be underwater at the car dealership or whatever. Those are things I didn't even know about until I kind of got into a world where I was learning, and frankly, from men many, many times about these amazing tools that make life so much easier, um, or about loan brokers and understanding the kinds of tools. And men are really great at finding tools that make their life easier. I would argue many women are challenged in that because we're first built to just like 
well, I'll hustle and I'll compensate and I'll do it and make up for it. And so we consistently put ourselves in this place of service as opposed to empowerment. So coming up for air and realizing, wait a minute, I'd like to have a little bit of freedom. I'd like to call the shots a little bit. Now, where are the tools I can find to help me leverage myself? Where are the advisors? Where are the people who can do all these things? They're, they're everywhere. Um, you just have to know that they're there so you can start to find them and then access them. Um, and uh, so the negotiation piece also, when you have that conversation about anything, whether it's about getting um, a partner to help better with chores because you know, you're busy and you deserve better partnership or you're at work and you want a better raise than they're offering you, knowing your full worth is really gonna help you stand in that room or, and or in that conversation and it'll impact things for sure. There's a lot more we could talk about this, but um, we have to kind of keep it on the surface, not the surface, but you know, the first level for this conversation. Um, I thought we could share a couple examples, if it, each of us, Adapia, um, of where our own journeys and awarenesses of these things have helped. Um, because I was definitely like a textbook example of a person who worked in service. And honestly, I still really am to some huge extent, but. I'm working in changing myself and, and actively looking to do that more and more. Um, and so I can share an example recently, and there are so many examples I could share over the years as a woman, but um, I've been working on a project with a company with some very successful FinTech entrepreneurs. And I had originally signed a contract where I got 2% of the company on site. And originally at my company, um, my husband, who was also a partner at the company, was working on the project with them. And eventually my husband decided these guys were jerks and he didn't want to be involved anymore. So then when the time came for me to get paid, I said, okay, guys, look, I'd like to be paid for the 2%. They said, well, your husband dropped out. And so when we signed 2%, we thought it was for him too. You're only going to get 1% now because he dropped out. Now there's a time where part of me would have gone into this spiral of like, oh my gosh, he abandoned me, he did this, I'm so unfortunate, I'm a victim, this is unfair, but they're right, or whatever, right? Instead, this time, I was like, are you kidding me? Excuse me? I'm a majority owner of my firm. You signed this deal with my firm, and I have done X and Y and Z for this. And I really asserted myself in this conversation, and then I even said like, oh, and by the way, I know you're looking to go and get funding and you certainly don't want a lawsuit on your hands, do you? That looks really bad to investors. So maybe we should just go ahead and honor the original 2%. And I think they came back originally, like they were like thinking they could do something with me on it. And instead they were like, unfortunately it seems we're not aligned. Let's just leave the 2% as it is and talk about something that we can negotiate on a go forward basis, which you know, wasn't even as good as I wanted, which is you're right, I'm sorry, but it was still a win. And I would never have been able to even do that, I think, if I hadn't come to a place of greater strength and knowing my, my value and my worth, which is, again, the inside piece that's super key to helping affect the outside piece. Adapia, did you want to talk about your... Well, um... Yeah, I mean, I kind of talked generally before about like really kind of having that awareness and, and, where, it, and where it started. So um, I was thinking we could continue with the presentation and then hear from... Um, from some of these, from the people that are with us. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and what's been what's been going through. So um, I'll just quickly kind of, this is a summary slide basically of, you know, the, the conversation of value and, and net worth. So things to continuously bear in mind and leverage, and you'll, you'll get a copy of, of the slides, I, I believe for, for people who've, who've come um, and the, um, and this video. So we have net worth, um, the financial value of assets minus liability. So essentially the difference between what you own and what you owe, um, some examples of assets, some examples of liabilities. Uh, we generally want this number to be trending up over time because as we've been taught or like, or, or what we know is we want to build a retirement fund so we can retire. Essentially, this is where this comes from, right? Um, now, I would challenge that and say there's a way different ways of thinking about how to use your net worth, especially especially your assets. And, you know, I'm thinking about creating economic value. So I want my money to make me money, right? I don't wanna be the income earning asset all the time. I wanna choose to work if I wanna work. There's different ways of making money. I'm a big proponent of passive income. It's essentially what I do for a living with the real estate. Um, 
And those are all also, by the way, they're very tax efficient. So you essentially don't pay tax on the income that you get from real estate if you do it right. Um, and this is why a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people leave their nine to five and they go into direct real estate because there's so many tax advantages. But in general, um, the way the way that I really think about this as an investor and as somebody who is building a net worth that will create at least one extra income or to be able to, to cover either mine or my husband's, in part for me, it's it's a necessity. We can't be dependent on a job. So whether it's from like my my mom, from the way that she grew up, essentially like very poor in Italy, like, you know, she was considered what you would call peasant. Um, and she really like had to work and work and work. And she instilled that in us, like, like your financial independence, your independence is you have your own money which was very kind of advanced for that time. And that's how she grew up. However, that is not true anymore. It's not only true anymore. You can't be in this, I'm going to continuously work for my money. Um, and when I think about net worth, I'm trying to create a set of assets. So whether it's investment properties or syndications or just the equity side of it, that makes me money that hits a target return annually. You can call those dividends for the most part. Like there's interest, there's dividends, um, there's distribution. And that we that we can have a different discussion about like tax implications of each one. But essentially what I'm trying to get at is you want I work towards and I encourage everyone to work towards a number that multiplied by a percentage can give you income today. You don't have to wait for retirement and draw down your funds. You can start doing that today strategically so that you have extra money every month, which in my case, I use it to reinvest um, because it helps to build the net worth over and over and over and over again. So that when I hit a target net worth, my, my working hours are 100% my choice. And that gives me a lot more independence, which is really important to me, a lot of flexibility. Um, and it allows me to, to move out of what has essentially been for me a survival state. Uh, I'm not from the US. Uh, I was born in Canada. My parents are Italian. And I've lived in like, like multiple countries all over the world. I make more money now than I've ever made. I do not feel safe here. And it's not because I'm not safe in America. Somebody's going to hurt me. I don't feel safe because of the way the country, the system is set up around healthcare, around all kinds of things like that. So partly for me, I know where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a place of creating a stability and a foundation that then over time gets to be to a place where I'm no longer in survival mode. Now that's me. I have huge awareness of myself and I invite everybody to, to do the same. So when I think about net worth and assets, I'm thinking, how can I make that money make money for me? How do I leverage the assets so that as it says down in that pink box, you don't always have to be the income earning assets. Um, and, you know, Jennifer, do you want to take the value of contributions piece? Yeah, sure. So um, one thing you want to do is protect against the worst, against, you know, the God forbid, what if bottom dropping out from things. And that's where the risk management piece comes in is making sure you've got protections for things that protect your business, protect your family, protect yourself. If God forbid you lost a partner that you are codependent, not codependent, but, you know, co-creating a life with other things. Um, then also becoming aware of your earning potential. So one of my really good friends was a master at renegotiating positions for herself over time. She would understand that, you know, she started as a legal secretary and she was getting a salary of 75K. Well, rather than staying at the same company for 30 years and maybe getting a 2% raise, she would talk to headhunters regularly. And every few years she would negotiate a new job somewhere else that would give her not just more salary, but also more vacation time paid. So she kept negotiating upward and upward because she understood her worth and she leveraged it instead of only thinking in service, which is again, what we as women are often taught to do. Um, also going into trying to choose very wisely with how you're allocating your time, instead of getting into automatic service reflex, it's what men are really good at is how is this serving me? 
What are my top priorities that will help leverage me into the position Adapia just des described, which is where can I put time into something that's going to give me passive income where I'm going to actually not be in survival mode? Wait, maybe I should prioritize something I can do today in addition to my job that's going to position me over the next 10, 15 years for more comfort and, and, and starting to prioritize and think very cogently on what leverage you have today and how you can allocate it for a higher reward because it is really important that you know you don't want to be like making your money because you were able to burn out yourself um, like a piston for 40 years ideally if you work if you're that valuable you can also work for 20 years and use your smarts and talents to get the other 20 years paid for through smart leverage and good protection it's kind of the thing we're kind of trying to help everybody here start thinking about and it's a process so this is just a one time, one conversation, but it's a long and ongoing exploration and process to be uh, taken further. So we want to have time for questions. So what we really just want to kind of emphasize again here is, and this is Adapia, I want you to be able to say it because you're really the one who came up with this phrase and I love it so much. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> You're amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I've said this, like, you know, like a few times, like, it's really like it's time to shift out of working for my money and move into my money works for me. Um, this is this is what it's what it's all about. And um, the reason we wanted to talk about net worth today and not just the financial aspect of net worth, but value, because that's really that's really even more important because that value will drive any kind of uh, any kind of net worth is that it starts with that with that awareness. And, you know, we want to bring these concepts, um, you know, and investment opportunities. This is something that we're, you know, that Jennifer and I are going to do in a, in, um, that we're doing rather in, in a mastermind um, where we could really dig in and do the asset building and do the passive income and just take it to sort of a different level where that financial portfolio is, is working um, for you. And the very first piece is awareness. Again, I really believe most of this is a paradigm shift for most women and, and me included in this. It's not like, oh, I'm saying something that I've already figured out. It's constant realization that, oh, I'm the one responsible for whether I choose to make my life better and easier by choosing to think more clearly and strategically or not. And I'm realizing I, I would like to do that. I would like to be more strategic. Oops, I went the wrong direction. Um, and it is a process of getting connected, getting information, keeping your ear on the ground, getting access to the many tools that are available. Just a quick reminder, um, statistics show that in 2030, which is literally like eight years away, the majority of 30 trillion in assets is gonna be controlled by women. We had last month a whole conversation about how much women control in terms of the money here in the US and globally and, and how much we've grown to be in that control position. Um, so, you know, you can always find that somewhere or come to us and we'll get you a copy of those um, conversations. But it's something to be reckoned with and something to be owned. It's a lot of power sitting on the table now that we have, and it's really time coming for us to take control of that more and embrace it. We said last month that it was like, you know, some women still, and I, again, me included, in some part of our brains, sees ourselves in the side seat of like a buggy seat connected to a, a motorcycle that a man is driving, when the reality of it is most women are the ones making the financial decisions for families and controlling how the money is spent. And it's really like we're in the car. We've bought the car. We filled it with gas. We may as well learn how to drive it. Um, so please, if this has been inspiring and you're interested in going further with any of this, be, be sure to know that you can join us here every month with Leadership Global. We're doing an ongoing series on micro topics. Um, and so we love having people here. Um, the whole goal is to help you build more of a foundation and get generational wealth working for you that's aligned with your goals because it's wonderful when you can put the power of your wealth and money um, to, to work for good. Uh, and then this is our credo here at WOW. You can read it for yourselves. I know you're all educated. And what we really just want to commit to is understanding our value, our full value and our capability and our deservingness of wealth and comfort. Honestly, it's funny. My daughter got a fortune cookie once that said, oh, you will be wealthy. And she said, no, I don't want to be wealthy. I want to be good. Because she somehow thought you couldn't be both. And I said, 
oh my gosh, honey, it's so much better if money can be in the power of good people in the hands of good, because then money's a magnifier. You can do more good with money or, you, you know, it magnifies whatever you are already. So if you're good and you have money, then you can do more good with it. And that's the goal to have all these beautiful women and all that we bring to the table to have more control over how wealth is shared and enjoyed and grown. And so, yes, if, uh, if you would like to learn more, get uh, in touch with either Adapia or myself. Our group is called Women of Wealth. It's an investment club and a mastermind. It has educational sessions with experts and specialists going further into some of the topics we talked about here. Uh, and we'll be sharing all the different tips and strategies we've all discovered. So each of the women in, in WOW is in an expert position of her own right in one shape or form. And when we connect and work across silos and share tools and tricks and tips and insights, we all become stronger and more abundant and more powerful um, and more able together. So there's a lot of also really empowering and frank discussions, forums for Q&A, quarterly in-person gatherings that are also really fun. Uh, and it's really here for those women who are looking to engage a little further uh, on the things we've talked about here and also in real practical terms. I mean, just as an example, Adapia and I will text each other sometimes and I'll ask her like, what do you think about this particular coin? Because I know she's an expert on all things crypto, right? Uh, or she'll ask me about something with risk management and each of us is able to become stronger and better, more powerfully positioned as a result of just these brass tax discussions. And that's part of the purpose of WOW, among many other things. Um, we really hope that you've enjoyed this month's conversation. I'll stop sharing my screen now. And um, I would love to open it up if it's okay to Q&A if anybody has any questions or contributions or thoughts. Well, this has been really great. I'm and Adapia already knows my situation a little bit. I've overshared. Um, surprise, surprise. Uh, but it's the I, I need to set up a one on one with you guys. Um, and do you want to share like your Calendly or something so people can make appointments with you? Or how do you how do you want to do this so that they know how to reach out to you individually? Oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? I can. Um, do you want to put our emails in the chat, Adapia? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll put my email and then can uh, can get a hold of me. But thanks. And just if anybody has anything to share, um, Barbara, I see that you've unmuted. I know you have. Yeah. It was, ah, she does so many amazing things in this space, too. So I'll let you take it away. Well, I love all the content. It's everything that I've built my business on around making Sure, women are what we say is financially fearless by providing them content, but also working with experts who really want to serve a female market. And, you know, Jennifer, my heart breaks from your story. And I wonder if your husband dropped out or if you dropped out versus your husband, if he would, they would have challenged him for the 2%. Um, and I just see women being suppressed at all areas um, in terms of real estate and, you know, housing, uh, earning wages, all of that. And so um, our goal at Purse Strings is to stop um, all that nonsense and really educate and, and engage with women. Um, Hannah Chapman's on here. She's one of our Purse Strings approved professionals. Um, she's one of the talented experts that we have in our community. But also, I think what's most critical about this discussion is that women are coming into the largest transference of wealth and are women ready um, emotionally um, you know, financially, educationally, to really know what to do when that money comes their way, because it's a very emotional topic. And we really need to learn that it's okay to have money, earn money, make money, um, and all of that around money. So thank you for your work here. This has been uh, fascinating. I love your resources. Um, I've already looked it up and I'm going to share it as well. So thank you. And I'll be at your next meeting. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you so much. And um, I also see Liz. Liz maybe came on. I don't know if you want to say a few words, but um, if the if anyone has met um, Nicole, um, that she's because she represents how women lead and how women invest. Uh, Liz is at How Women Invest. I'm an LP in their fund, and this is this is where that when money in the right hands changes the world, money in my hands changes the world. And I do that through venture investing with Liz and how women invest. So I would love to give Liz a couple minutes to talk about that. Well, 
Thank you, Anapia. It's so fun to see you in this context, <laughs> rocking the message and inspiring this room full of women. So thank you for giving me this glimpse. And Jennifer, thank you so much for this amazing session. Uh, How Women Invest was founded uh, just a couple of years ago. We're a new emerging manager venture fund. We invest exclusively in 100% women-owned startups. And we're the outgrowth of a network of 14,000 senior executive women, How Women Lead, where we do advocacy for women on corporate boards and all kinds of different leadership development for women. Because I think probably like most people here, we believe that the world is better when women have a hand in uh, a seat at every table where power counts. So it, it's been our absolute pleasure to get to know Adapia and um, hearing her speak in our meetings in our organization about her story and how she transformed her mindset drew me here to this event. And I am thrilled to see your credo and really understand the alignment between our two organizations and uh, to see how many other women really are excited about stepping into their power because there's nothing indelicate about that. In fact, it's all for the better. Thank you, yeah, I love that. It's not indelicate, right? It's like, it's not impolite to talk about money. It's not impolite to talk about, like to be assertive. Like that's such a, such a big, such a big part of this. Um, so, yeah. Right. Does anyone else have maybe just any like parting thoughts or um, even a question for us in the next couple of minutes? I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start, but um, I, I really, I'm at the point where I should have a retirement fund and I have zero. And so I have a small inheritance that I've recently gotten and I, I really need to figure out because I've always just kind of given it to my sister to handle or my family, you know, and then now here I am. So I'm, you know, the, I really resonate with the idea of taking control and looking at it, even if it doesn't look so pretty. Um, I'm really in line with that. So I really appreciate you guys a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I want to honor you for saying that. That's not an easy thing to say. I really want to honor you for, for saying that. And that's like 80% of the battle you just won. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like okay. And Karen, it's so much more common that you, we, almost everybody has this like shame that they think that they should have something bigger. They imagine a lot of other people have something better and bigger, but the reality of it is we're often very busy, especially women. We're so busy on this wheel of service and, and we put ourselves last. So it's okay. It's totally natural and normal to be in a situation like that. And actually, if you didn't ever take stock, you would end up very poorly. But because you take a moment and have a moment of realization, you create that space. And then you being as capable as you are, since you are a woman, you're going to be able to take charge and change that. And then the good news is there are so many tools. There are so many tools and resources. The, the, the nutty part is we actually cut ourselves out from access to how much is actually there and available out of this perception of shame or we shouldn't or we don't or we don't have time or we or we don't have time the time property thing again um all the different ways in which we can block ourselves from it but if we choose to just allow it for ourselves then the, the resources can kind of like flow right in and that's mm -hmm. the good part yeah, no more magical thinking and the clock the time is up <laughs> no more of that so yeah. So I know we have to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Kate, or? Kate does. Kate has her hand up. Oh. Oh, Kate. Sorry about that. I didn't see that. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. We might not have enough time, um, but I I personally really love to do my numbers check-ins, and I'm, I'm a little bit more addicted than quarterly, like unabashedly. But do you guys have um, any gamification tools that, that gets you excited about looking at these, like it's such a long slog, building wealth is such a long slog. Do you guys have any platforms or apps that you find helps make that a bit more of a celebration or tracks it better than just spreadsheets? Mm, that's a really good question, the gamification. That's that celebrating part. The, uh, the I have a trouble with that because I'm like, oh, I'm spending money on myself. That's like a whole other, <laughs> that's like a whole other thing. I use spreadsheets. There's a lot of, there's a lot of apps that you can connect all your bank accounts. I'm not a huge fan 
of that for like, I mean, maybe like security purposes and stuff like that. Like it's beautiful. Like if you have betterment or wealth front, you can connect everything and they can tell you how close you get to retirement or personal capital is another one. Or even like, I know SoFi does it now. Everybody does it. They, they all want access to your data so they can sell to you. So I'm not a huge fan. I really like my spreadsheets. Um, and I'm not sure that's a really good question. I have to think about how can we gamify it so that it, it's, if not, I'd love to do that with you. Cause I yeah. have so many ideas on that, on what an app I could know. do. Cause I just realized during this, that I'm going to be reaching a very significant milestone in my net worth. had no idea. And I want to make it kind of a, want to recognize that and pause in it for a minute. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Let's talk about that. That would be really fun. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah.